Hello and welcome. This is June 9th. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And what we're looking at today is uh, the COVID-19 response to education funding. Um, with us today, we have the Secretary of Education who is gonna just give us a little update on where we are in terms of um, what, what, the, what next year may be looking like. So welcome, Secretary French. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, it's good to see you all again. <clears throat> yes, I uh, appreciate the invitation to come in and speak on this issue. I thought it would be useful if I provided you a quick update on our planning to reopen schools for in-person instruction. Um, we, we've been working likewise uh, in partnership with other legislative groups to uh, work on the funding piece, but uh, more or less on the front burner for me has been this reopening planning, uh, which I think is uh, really um, going to be useful to this, this funding question as well. So we have um, a group that's been working specifically on the public health guidance that will be used to inform the reopening conditions. Uh, that group's been really working uh, very effectively, um, largely led by Department of Health, but uh, including uh, various stakeholder groups in the education community, also augmented by other medical folks in the state, um, virologists, pediatricians, and so forth. Uh, that guidance is fairly stable. Uh, I expect it to be published next week. Uh, that's our time frame. Um, but you know, my takeaway from all of that, and just uh, coordinating and discussing the issues with my national partners as well, um, I think we're very increasingly confident that we will be able to open school for in-person instruction. Uh, so that's the good news. Um, <clears throat> I think the health guidance is very specific and will be very constructive to inform districts in their preparations for enacting in-person instruction. I think what we intend to do next is to uh, explore, I think what'll be a necessary review of the decision-making processes around what I'll call, or the CDC would call reactive school closure. So we're gonna be able to get very tight on I think the public health guidance relative to opening schools, uh, but then we're gonna have to contemplate um, schools, school districts, some being open, some being closed, some being doing remote learning, some being in a mix, perhaps a hybrid disposition. And uh, we'll need to uh, articulate who's gonna make those decisions and under what condi uh, considerations those decisions get made. So that'll sort of be the next phase of the work, but sort of strategically, we, uh, we pointed very quickly on to get the public health guidance stable. Uh, the CDC helped them to a certain extent, but we had to work a lot with our uh, public health experts in Vermont to define that further and then have that also be informed by uh, the real world uh, wisdom, if you will, of the practitioners on the ground. So anyway, I just say that's that's forthcoming very soon. I will also observe, uh, I'm sure you're probably aware of national organizations, uh, the American uh, Association of School Administrators and the National Organization for School Business Officials have uh, released some modeling uh, around reopening costs. Um, and I, th I thought that would be very useful if you hadn't seen that. Basically, um, when we start thinking about costs relative to reopening, which is when I start thinking of CRF in particular, uh, I think that's a good place to think. Um, the national modeling points to something like out of those groups at $490 per pupil. Uh, so, so Vermont, that would translate to about $40 million. Uh, you know, that's that's as good as estimate as anyone has at this point. And I think it's uh, that estimate includes things much more uh, broadly than just uh, conditioning school facilities and also includes staffing costs and so forth. Um, but I thought that I just mentioned that if you hadn't seen that, but that's where we'll go next. Once we sort of once I lock in or publish this first iteration of our uh, health guidance, we'll be able to turn very quickly, I think, to the costing out of um, what would be necessary to, to carry this off. In particular, how do you see our funds to, to support that work? Thank you. Do you have a sense of, um, I guess, our calendars are set by the by the, by the career and tech centers, I believe. Um, is there any sense of, of timing of opening, any early opening? Yeah, it's a good point. I think we're, um, you know, this is a, it's a very complex planning process. And I think uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot, many questions that surface, including resources and funding. Uh, the, the idea was to at least get a definition of what the public health conditions would be for opening schools. I mean, you know, the issues of social distancing and, you know, uh, protective equipment and so forth. What do those things actually look like? And I think we have a good 
idea what that would be. Um, by interjecting this out into uh, the community, it will also start to provoke questions of, I would say, decision making, but also the policy and regulatory ramifications that might be necessary. So we will surface questions on student attendance, calendar day, I'm sure, and uh, that, that'll be in that sort of next layer of work about how, how folks best see that to happen. So as much as possible, from my perspective, I'd really like the public health guidance to sort of drive that conversation. Um, but we couldn't do it all at once. Uh, it would be almost impossible to get the public health guidance done if we had to consider everything as one comprehensive guidance package. So I think we're in a good place to get the public health guidance out uh, and that'll stimulate a lot of other thinking around these lines. Thank you. Any questions for the secretary? <clears throat> okay, what I'd like to do, um, we were given a task, I'm sorry, Representative Austin, did you have a question for the secretary? Yes, hi. Um, thank you, Secretary French. I am wondering about, I'm reading a research, uh, an article in the New York Times by Dana Goldstein, June, 2020, and that research shows students falling months behind during virus disruptions. New research by September, 2020, most students will have fallen behind where they would have been if they had stayed in classrooms with some losing the equivalent uh, full school years, academic gains, racial and socioeconomic achievement gaps will most likely widen because of the disparities in access to computers, home internet connections, and direct instruction from teachers. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about this because I think in 2021, you know, that there'll be budget cuts, I think, to a lot of supporting that, you know, uh, educators in terms of um, being able to catch students up. And I'm just wondering uh, if you thought about the possibility of, and I don't know, again, I don't know how to do this, but just for maybe four to six months, um, being able to hire resources in a, in a special category um, to address these student gaps, to catch them up so that they're on grade level. So especially I think in math and literacy, um, so they just don't fall behind, you know, and maybe never be able to catch up. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Representative Austin. I think for me that underscores the necessity to reopen school for in-person instruction. And, um, you know, just to back up a little bit on that, um, I think, you know, we, um, certainly from a reactive standpoint, have been emerging, uh, managing a very, uh, you know, significant historical event in terms of it being a national emergency and an emergency in Vermont. Um, and that's required a lot of rapid decision-making and so forth. And one of the after effects certainly um, has been, we've created an opportunity in Vermont, uh, largely due to our disciplined approach to the social mitigation to plan for the next steps in our response a little more thoughtfully. We have, have a window of opportunity to do that. Um, but for me, it just underscores, once again, in spite of that, and, this, and certainly the significance of the public health emergency around COVID-19, I think I've increasingly come to acknowledge, and many educators have, that there's also an educational emergency here that has to be addressed. And um, we're, we're, as you know, increasingly becoming comfortable with living with the virus, um, and we can't uh, stay in a shutdown mode. Uh, for a prolonged period of time. And from an educational st standpoint, it really necessitates my conclusion is that we need to, you know, think very, uh, I'll say aggressively, but very intentionally about the need to reopen school and why we need to do that. Um, I think certainly a better part of the rationale to do that, not only to get the essential systems back up to support students and families, but also to begin uh, a period of assessment so we can understand uh, the effects that have happened uh, but I, I think it would be premature to say there, uh, we certainly can anticipate there being effects, but I think part of the, the impetus and the urgency in my, from my perspective to reopen school is to begin that assessment so we can start to ascertain the true effects. And I think they're gonna um, be a priority for school districts, uh, not only the assessment piece, but also um, the remediation. But you know, actually step one is just to reopen schools right now. And that, that's a big enough task in its planning process uh, in itself. 
uh, but certainly one of the objectives for reopening is to begin a, a period of assessment so we can understand the impact on student learning. Thank you, Secretary uh, French. I'm just um, wondering Serena, if there's it. Serena, what? we're gonna start to get into some of the things that we're gonna be doing on how we're gonna be getting money out to, to folks. So if we can keep that focused on here and there might be some opportunities on, on where we are with um, yeah. uh, continuity of learning and learning loss will probably emerge here. So I wanna keep us moving because we've gotta end up with a product and we have to have a product by tomorrow. Can I just ask one one question of the secretary? Go ahead. Thank you. I'm just wondering, is there anything that we could do to help you have uh, funding in place on hold um, that you could access quickly after the assessments were done so that you could rapidly, um, again, uh, address the needs of the students? Well, I think a, a certainly an important strategy is to get the ESSER funds out the door. Uh, those are the, uh, you know, the 90% the of the $30 million. That's a direct shot in the arm, so to speak, to school districts. And as much as possible, if we can target those funds to make the educational impact uh, that you've alluded to, I think that would be an important strategy. So um, we've, we've essentially put a hold on the ESSER application for a couple of reasons. One was to coordinate with legislative leaders about the response to the ED fund and so forth and to coordinate the use of CRF, the gear, uh, other funding that's on the table. Uh, but the ESSER funds, um, you know, are directed ideally towards the educational Im impact of the virus. They're also, they have a longer tail, so we can effectively use those for a year at least. Um, so it provides us more flexibility. So I think you know, if we can sort of reserve the impact of those funds for the educational issues and try to address sort of the physical plant supplies and so forth through CRF as part of reopening, I think that would be an important strategy. Thank so, you. I'm going to call you on you in a second. I just want to set uh, a picture of what we're, where we're going from here. And that is um, a, a task that's been given to me by the speaker. And that is basically the big picture right now of the, we have 1.2 $5 uh, billion dollars, uh, of COVID relief funds available to the state. Um, of that, my understanding is 275 million have already been allocated either through the joint fiscal process, budget adjustment, transitional budgeting, or municipal lending bill. And there's 400 million that's being held at the moment to fill budget holes um, or for second tier priorities. And then there's 575 million that the speaker's looking at for first tier committee priorities. Uh, what she has given to me at numbers to work with is the first tier priority is how would we spend $50 million? Second tier is $75 million. On the side there is the $150 million that is not addressed in there that, uh, a, that we are looking to figure out a way to deal with our current budget gap. Um, and from the, as you may remember from the work done by the uh, Ways and Means Committee, um, the bill that was put forward it chose not to leave that 150 million to the property taxpayers, but was setting it aside as, as possibly being something that we could use for federal funds. We don't know yet. We're still waiting for further guidance. So what, what I want us to talk about today is the spending of uh, $50 million on first round, $75 million if it's available. Um, and the other thing is that I've also been tasked to make this, this split between higher education and pre-K-12. Um, I have asked uh, if we could flip that <laughs> so we could have 75 million in the first year and 50 in the second. Um, I should know a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, the bill that the draft that um, Larry and Peter Conlon and I, in, in an effort to be ready for our conversation today, met with um, Joint Fiscal Office. And we had a few other of the V's join us for a few of those meetings, the V's, basically the, the, the education advocacy groups to help us start with a first draft. So what we have for you today is a first draft for this is something for us to talk about. Um, all of the committees are being given this task. We have kind of a different 
picture because in a sense, we're trying to figure out um, how we're addressing the needs of 151 different school districts in 54 supervisory unions. I don't know if I have that number right or not. I it, don't remember, but it's about like that. So, um, and as we know, those districts are gonna have different needs. Those districts have already spent money differently. So being too prescriptive um, might help one district and hurt another. So we've put it, we've put this together um, as a first draft for the committee. So we'll at least have a document to talk about um, from there. And now that I've set that, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Jim speak, but I wanna make sure Caleb, you you have an opportunity to, to ask a question or make a comment. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, question for the secretary, um, appreciating Chair Webb's uh, framework that she just kind of reiterated there. So we're, we're kind of talking about this $50 million and, um, I was part of a conversation yesterday with some uh, uh, hunger advocates and also um, some members of, um, of some Senate committees who have kind of a, a different process. Uh, and a question came up that I thought was a good one, which is just, do we have a sense of how much of that 50 million might be spent already? In other words, here are these districts I know have been working with the Agency of Education to track COVID expenses. I guess I, I don't have a sense of uh, how much of the 275 uh, Chair Webb alluded to that's sort of already been spent might have gone to those already incurred expenses or whether those expenses are basically coded and waiting for their first reimbursement so that that reimbursement really needs to come out of this 50 million uh, yes. prior to any new goals. Is that is that? I, yes, I, that, no, I guess I'm just correct. kind of figuring out what percentage of that 50 million is essentially um, spent, even in a rough basis, if we know that answer. Yeah, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about that. And it will be totally specific. I know that Brad James has been gather, gathering some information that I think can come, come forward as we look at how we're addressing this. Um, I noticed that I did not include uh, the state colleges or the university in this conversation. That was a problem on my part, um, but at least I uh, think, Kate, yeah. Would it be okay to let the secretary take a shot at answering my question? Uh, um, yes, uh, and I also want you to know that that's going to be part of the conversation about the 50 million that, that we're talking about, but go ahead. Um, Secretary Prince. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Brad can certainly fill you in. I, I'm time limited today to 1230, but I think Brad's done some modeling on that. In particular, I think the, the area that's, I think, a very useful strategy to examine is to what extent some of the costs for staffing um, that have occurred in fiscal year 20 as a result of the emergency order, meaning that we require districts to maintain payroll essentially as an economic stability measure. Uh, we increasingly are thinking that that could be used as a CRF, um, and that's about $16 million or so, just to give you a sense of the magnitude. Um, and that in turn would, uh, you know, limit the liability for towards the Ed Fund uh, for districts if those those costs were picked up by the CRF. So no, just double. Brad, Brad can fill you in on more specific, I think. And, and I think we're, we're going to get to that when we get to that section of, of of the document that we're talking about. Um, just, just to bear in mind that one of the things about the ESSER funds is they were more flexible in their use. CRF is much tighter. So I think what you're gonna see, what we're gonna look for here is instead of spending those on ESSER funds, the current thing that we're talking about is taking that what was the, the value of the ESSER funds and attributing them right away to CRF funds. And, and bringing that forward. So um, perhaps I, I'm gonna have Jim present where we are and I think that that will stimulate uh, conversations going forward um, as to some of the, the details that people are interested in. And Brad will have an opportunity to talk about what's been, what his understanding of what, what has been spent so far and how it's currently being accounted for. So Jim, can you? Sure. Okay. Present what we've talked about, and this is a starting, this is a draft, and we also have to finish it tomorrow. So I'm going to, Avery, we're going to have to set up another meeting for tomorrow morning before floor. Or tomorrow morning actually doesn't have to be before floor. Okay, should I start? Yes, please. Okay. 
Uh, so for the record, uh, Jim Damory, let's console. We are walking through draft uh, 1.2 of this, of this language about uh, use of the uh, CRF funding. Um, so subsection, subsection A deals with appropriations for pre-K through grade 12, and B, which we'll come to, deals with appropriations for higher education. So uh, for um, this uh, section here, uh, sub subsection, uh, we have first $20 million being appropriated from the um, relief fund to AOE in fiscal year 2020 for the purpose of reimbursing fiscal year 2020 coronavirus costs incurred by school districts. Uh, the agency uh, shall administer this uh, reimbursement program, issue guidance to school districts on reimbursable costs, and establish a process for submission of and reimbursement for these costs. Uh, two, uh, deals with appropriation for next fiscal year. So the sum of 20,000 is appropriated from the uh, relief fund to the agency in fiscal year 21 for the purpose of providing grant funding to supervisory unions to assist with the costs of reopening schools. Uh, the agency will administer this grant program, issue guidance as SUs on costs that are eligible, uh, and shall allocate grant funding to SUs in an amount up to their proportional allocation of funding for uh, Title one a funds. Uh, Subdivision three uh, is an appropriation for fiscal year 21 uh, in, in the amount of 45 million uh, to the agency uh, for the purposes of providing grant funding to SUs to assist with the costs of helping students recover from learning loss due to school closure and remote learning during the state of emergency and the cost of providing social and emotional support to students uh, and school staff resulting from the pandemic. Uh, again, the agency would administer the grant program, issue guidance um, and allocate the grant funding in accordance with the um, Tel one funds. So just to, just to stop right there, what what is listed here is uh, 40 million of the first 50 million that would be going to our uh, pre-K 12 schools um, related to the expenditures that they've already spent in 2020 that they would just be submitting to the agency for reimbursement and an additional 20 to prepare for the coming school year. Have I got explained that correctly? Yeah. Questions on that so far? And then the other 45 million comes from tier two, their second tier. Sarita Austin, and then Peter Fagan. Can someone just explain the Title I-A funds? What, what does that mean? What, what, how are those defined? I think that'd be best for Brad to explain it if you could. Yeah, Brad, I think you're, you are the one to explain it most clearly. What, what, Title I is the federal program to, to offset poverty to work on poverty kids. Um, and we get money based on you know, poverty counts from, this, from the federal folks. Then we allocate that money out. Um, yeah. What this is referencing is that that the money that we're talking about allocating out now, this ESSER money, or the, pardon not the ESSER money, the CRF money, is not Title One money. It's just going out on the same percentages that Title One is going out on currently. So if a district got ten percent of the statewide, which is a huge number, ten percent of the statewide Title One money, then it would get ten percent of this money. This is this is this was kind of this came about for the CRF money, based on how the ESSER money, that other that other pot of money, was directed to be um, allocated by the federal government. And that's related to funding for FY twenty one, right? Whereas the first part is just covering your expenses, covering what you you paid, for example, to deliver food excess costs in one thing or another. And you've started to collect that, correct? 
you started. I, I, I have, I have, I have rough numbers of, of estimates so people have not, not nothing in detail. We will be collecting it in detail. Peter Fagan. Thank you, Kate. Um, so one comment, and then I need to let you know when I'm going to have to leave for that meeting, okay. Speaker. Um, so the funds are not indicated for FY20 funding. Um, I would recommend that you put in something in there that states that any funds that are unallocated uh, at the end of the fiscal year shall shall carry forward into the next fiscal year for expenditure. That way, that that way they're they're not stuck and waiting for us to take a proactive uh, you know stance on that doing that. So we do that with the with the appropriations bill where appropriate, and I'd recommend you do it here because this may not get out until the twenty sixth of June, something like that. I think we might. I think that might be coming. I think that's a really important point. There's a surplus piece at the bottom, but it doesn't really talk to the to what I think I'm saying. So, okay. And then I'm I'm going to have to get off at about eight in about eight minutes. Okay. So we should probably speaker. we should get to what we're talking about with higher ed. That's, no, that's okay. You can you um you know I've I've read it and I yeah I think it's fine. Um, I just again there's a piece in higher ed same thing. You know, the, on any funds that are not allocated as of end of the year shall carry forward. Um, of course, some of these funds have to be spent by the end. Oh, they all have to be by spent the end of the, the calendar year. year. Yeah. That's right. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very confusing. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Just the year should just start in July. <laughs> okay, we'll have an opportunity to go back and look at that, everybody, to see how we're how we're doing it. But this is just a big, broad, broad look. So now we're looking at money that we're going to be spending for a start starting document for higher ed. Okay, and uh, essentially this is a $10 million um, appropriation for fiscal year 20. Um, the agency is not defined here, we're not sure which it should be, so we're hoping appropriations will have an answer for that. Um, and it's for costs incurred uh, by UVM and uh, the Vermont State Colleges. Um, and the agency will administer the reimbursement program, issue guidance, uh, and establish a process. Um, and up to five million may be allocated to each of UVM and VSC um, to cover reimbursable costs. The next subdivision uh, is a an appropriation of thirty million dollars uh, for fiscal year twenty one and everything remaining in that subdivision is the same as they just went through. So again, going to an undefined agency to cover current costs for UVM and BSC, uh, the agency will administer, et cetera, and up to 15 million uh, would be out um, each of UVM and, and BSC. One quick question. I, I just let somebody in that ends 526. Phone number. Is that you, Representative Matos? I believe that's Jeff Francis. Oh, that's Jeff Francis. OK, great. Thank you. Subsection C, and there's just a few more to go here. C says that um, consistent with the stated purposes of the funding uh, above, the guidance issued by AOE and the other agency shall allow for, for use of that funding to cover all costs permitted under law. Um, so this is obviously going to be comprehensive in terms of the ability to use these funds. Um, D is um, language that we're putting into all these uh, all these bills coming out of various committees, um, which says the general assembly determines that the expenditure of monies as set forth in this section is necessary and is due to or resulting from COVID nineteen. Um, do the reasons set forth above, basically. So um, E uh, is clarifying that the appropriations for pre-K through 12 should not be used for costs incurred by a pre-K program that is not operated by a school district. So these funds are not designed to go to private uh, child care centers. And F uh, says that essentially when a district has surplus funds, um, let's say a district has surplus funds in, in the fiscal year 2020. Normally, they can't be used um, until uh, fiscal year 2022 because they have to be audited first to confirm that there are surplus funds and what the amount is. 
This says um, that you can carry over those funds in fiscal year 21 without waiting for an audit um, if the school has a reasonable basis to believe that has the surplus funds. Uh, um, so it basically cuts off a year and allows them to be used more quickly. Um, the next page is- Mr. Language Mr. Reagan, that's the language you want beefed up? Is that what you're saying? Yes, Kate, I think we need to, because that speaks just to uh, the education fund normal funding and the fact that you're going to be able to use it quicker. We're talking about the, we need to also do a piece in there regarding the coronavirus funds and that they may be carried forward if they cannot be spent in FY20. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then next page, we don't have to go through the rest of this. This is language that will be in the um, Appropriations bill applies to all of this, all of these provisions from all the different policy committees. So uh, I won't go through this unless you want me to, but it's basically just FYI. So in tier one, we have 40 million for public schools and 10 million for our public institutes of higher learning. And then in tier two, um, we have 45 in public schools and 30, I think, 30 in higher ed. Um, just to clarify, do we, do we need to, are we required to include the um, independent colleges? I think that's part of the ESSA funding. Okay. I don't, think, I don't think that's part of this CRF funding. Oh, well, okay. So we don't have to account for it in this, um, in this month. Brad, can you, can you help me there? Nobody at AOE does higher ed. Yeah, 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 I, course, course, I, course I can't. I know, I know that in the, in the CARES Act under the ESSA, there is no higher ed. I see, I see Secretary French, but he may know. Yeah, Secretary French. Yeah, I, I think uh, ESSER is, has nothing to do with higher ed. Um, there's a piece in the GEAR Act funding, which is 4.4 million that could be applied to institutes of higher learning, education, excuse me. <clears throat> but there is a, we call the equitable share provision of ESSER, uh, which requires school districts to share some of their funding with independent uh, K-12 institutions, not higher ed institutions. Okay, but the CRF funds, um we don't necessarily have to share in some proportion with um, independent colleges that you're aware of? Yeah, I, my understanding is CRF is really uh, up to you, um, okay. you know, in accordance, in accordance with the, the program. Okay. Um, thank you, Peter Fagan, for joining us. We will miss you. <laughs> Kathleen James. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, um, and I'm pretty sure I, I know the reason, but I'm assuming that any CARES funding for um, private pre-K providers would be coming in a different part of the overall package, coming through the Human Services Committee or something like that? That's my understanding, is if you're looking at who needs PPE and masks and those kind of things, that's going to be picked up in child care. One thing that is probably a question is what about continuity of learning um, that we haven't necessarily addressed. But in, in terms of um, buildings and, and childcare, um, th that's happening in the other committee. How we reconcile, oh, oh Peter Conlon, do you have <laughs> an answer to that? Uh, no, I was on a different topic. Okay. I'm just waiting my turn, thank you. Okay, um, but it is, it is a question, Kathleen, that, that we, we may need to be addressing at the moment. I'm, and again, I, just to, to clarify, and maybe um, um, Chip can help us as well, and as well as Jim, this document that we're, we're putting together is really just a recommendation to appropriations, and they are ultimately going to be looking at everything. Um, there may be piles of money moved from one place to another that we don't know about, but this was our opportunity to address at least this section of it. Yep. In ter terms of higher ed, I can tell you that they could use the full 50. <laughs> They've already given me all the ways to spend it. I just wanna make sure that we're supposed to, that our direction of funds is supposed to be limited. 
I, I guess to public that we're not supposed to be thinking here about private childcare providers because I know they're in trouble too. We sort of- And I assume that's beyond the scope of, of our committee and what we're looking at here. We, we talked about that the other day. Um, Chelsea was helpful in that as well. Um, and I see Chip, are you, do you have, are you gonna to respond to this topic? Or something else? Um, not not the not about whether or not um, private child care is being considered here. Yeah. Okay. Let's just finish with that. So private child care is being addressed in House Human, Human Services. Services. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So health and safety that'll be child care. Continuity of learning that gets a little squishier. Um. Okay, uh, uh, Chip. Um, just to your question about, or your point about um, this being a recommendation, I, 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 we're going to be looking at it as more than a recommendation. I mean, this is, we're gonna hear from all the committees about how the amount of money that they have been told by the speaker is sort of within their purview to, to spend is, is, is to be spent. I mean, we're, given, as you pointed out, the time constraints here, we're not gonna be able to take testimony or we're, we're gonna take the committee's um, recommendations, if you wanna call them that, um, as really the, they're, they're um, telling us how we should be spending that money. As always, you know, the, the appropriations committee is gonna have, have to look carefully at it and, and try to make an assessment based on the information we have, but, um, I don't, I would take this, you know, what comes to our committee should be really what you believe is the best way to spend the money um, and, and not think that we're going to, you know, massage that in any real way. But you could take some out and you could put some in. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this is a conversation that probably needs to have people at a little bit higher level than I am to yeah. really give a, an answer, but um, I, I have not been under the impression that we are going to be adjusting the amounts that the committees have to spend. Um, that's that's a decision that you know I, speaking just for myself, I believe has been made at the speakers level, perhaps in consultation with chairs, but at the speakers level, and um, I, I don't think our committee is going to say no. The House Ed has less than than the $50 million you said, or more. I think we're gonna take what you send us and uh, and as long as we know that that's within what the speaker um, sort of designated as, as an appropriate amount for your committee. But just to clarify on this, this is not something that goes to the floor and gets, do you know what the, the procedure is on this? I'm a little confused. Well, my understanding again, <laughs> Yeah, I'm telling you what I know from where I sit, but um, is that we're going to put it most most of the recommendations from the committees is going to come to our committee and get put into a single bill. Um, the Commerce Committee is, is separate. They're going to have a separate bill. But other than that, pretty much we're going to have a single bill um, that will leave our committee and go to the floor in that form. And then, of course, you know, anyone can amend the bill or, yeah. or make a try Thank to change you. it there. Um, Peter Conlon, and then I want to get some feedback from the field. Uh, I just wanted to, I, I don't think this came up, but in, uh, and that is the, the division of the money in the first 50, uh, the, the 10 for um, higher ed versus the 40 for uh, pre-K to 12, um, is largely based on some math that Brad James did looking at the numbers of students involved in, in each organization. So I just wanted to let people know that. Yeah, maybe maybe Brad, you could um, talk to us about that. So we've come up with 20,000, 20 million. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was just, I was kind of rolling numbers around in my head um, as, as Representative Collins said, I was looking kind of at Roughly, what, what, how many, how many students are in the public system? Um, how many students are in the college system? Just kind of very rough ideas, and I'm re recognizing that the cost of college is more than the cost of the elementary school. I just, and I made the suggestion of, of taking that fifty million dollars, taking roughly twenty percent of it, and this, I think I've ended up with twenty percent of it, and 
applied that to the higher education. Simply, and I, I threw it out there simply because people were talking back and forth with numbers. And, um, there's there's no hard number behind that. It's just the numbers that I'm familiar with and kind of thinking of. That's all. Okay, Chloe, do you have anything to add? Because you've been pretty involved in this. Um. I don't have anything to add. Um, if it would be helpful, we can share that table that um, sort of shows the cost buckets. Um, but other than that, um, I mean, I, I uh, really, when it comes down to, to, the, to the numbers, it was, you know, um, you could spend all of the money on all of these things. So, um, it's sort of just a balancing act, like what Brad was just talking about. So the first part, we're just looking at refunding, basically. Brad? I'm not sure if this is the right time to bring it up, but but I did look at the language that, that Jim had drafted and, and went through. Please. And, and in, in subsection F, which we're talking about the surplus, my, under, my understanding from the conversations we were having yesterday was that people wanted to make sure that that money that was reimbursed by the CRF money in FY20 was shall be rolled forward into FY21. Um, I think the way Jim has it drafted, it's, it's, it's may use it. And I, I think it'd be, I think the idea, if I remember correctly, was to say that, that money would be used in FY21 to offset the deficit in the end fund. And I can send Jim some su suggested language on that if, if he'd like, or if, if that's the way the committee would like to go. And you, you've seen that language, correct, um, Jim? He, he, no, he has not right I now. Have. So. Not. Oh, you have? I have, yeah. Okay. I sent it to him. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Comes okay. Um, Caleb, Elder. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple a couple questions. I, I, I think that I get the basic framework and it seems helpful. Um, I There's $125 million that I count here and that makes sense because we had 50 tier one and 75 tier two. Um, I know we're doing some creative replacing with the ESSER money, which I'm gonna call $28 million as a school share. Correct me if I got that wrong, but I'm just going to roll with 28 million. Um, I don't understand how that dovetails with this money, and I want to make sure that that ESSER money is clearly um, over and above anything from the tier one that we give the schools. That's entirely the schools. So in the long term, whatever whatever the schools get here, I want to just make sure they're getting 28 million in addition from ESSER at some point. So that's that's just kind of, I'm, I'm putting that out as my assumption and please correct me if I've got that wrong because I know there's some, you know, there's some stuff with the Title I allocations and the independent schools and it's been held back, but there's more flexibility. Anyway, so with that said, what I see of the 50 million here, I would like maximum flexibility in the 40 for the public schools um, because whether they're covering costs incurred in FY20 um, or they're covering anticipated costs for FY21, there's a donut hole in the middle, which we're in right now. Um, I'm very concerned about food security. Um, we're still in FY21 and yet schools are closed. And yet, uh, I know in our district, we've been spending $5,000 a day on busing. So that's 60 days, we've got about $300,000 just into busing. Now our food service has actually been a net revenue gainer because we're getting a higher level of compensation from the federal system. But the busing is a critical cost and, and busing from June 10th to June 30th, well, that's, that's not exactly a school year reimbursement and it's not exactly preparing during FY21. So I just wanna see that any of these dollars that have to be spent through September, it's just like an open grant program for the districts to access for these things. Because I know some districts are saying, hey, we're not gonna do food service this summer. We cannot afford it. Um, again, I, I, Chloe had mentioned maybe this adds it. Well, if we gave the whole 50 million to the districts, it was gonna be a half a million each. If we give 10 to the colleges, it's 400,000 each. I think our district's already spent 300,000 of that. So, so we just need some clarity about um, 
tracking what you've already spent, how much you're already going to get. And then if there's anything left of that, that you have total flexibility to use it. And then also saying, and by the way, this is other 28 million from Esser. If all that's true, that's great. I just want to make sure that their 28 million isn't somehow in this 40. Um, because that to me would not be equitable uh, division with this, with the college system. Thanks. That was long. I know. Thanks for hearing me out. And just to, to clarify with Jim, that is really what we had been thinking is that we want the flexibility for people to be submitting COVID eligible uh, expenses that the agency would be able to clarify. So uh, is it COVID related? The agency knows and would be pro and is to provide guidance. Is that correct, Jim? Uh, it is correct in terms of the guidance. Um, in terms of the way this is drafted now, uh, there are three appropriations uh, for uh, pre-K through 12. The first is broad, broad like uh, Rep. Elder mentioned, for any, any, any expense. But the second and third are more targeted based on our conversation yesterday. So the second is to assist with the cost of reopening schools. That's less broad than for any, any use, obviously. And the third is for the purpose of um, uh, helping students recover from learning loss and you know, for social and emotional support. That's more narrow. So you could broaden those two other two out to be for any eligible COVID cost, but that is not how it's drafted currently. And, and I think that's definitely um, something that the committee will will review, needs to review. Brad, please. I, th I think to go directly to what I what I see as Representative Elmer's direct question, no, the money that we're talking about right now is coronavirus relief fund. It is not the ESSER money. A little a little louder, Brad. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I apparently have an internet issues here. Yeah, um, no, that's good. The, 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 an the answer is no. The money that we're talking about right now is coronavirus relief money. It is not ESSER money. The ESSER money is separate from this. And, and Chloe will certainly correct me if I'm wrong on that. But we, we are not talking about that $28 million. Okay. And what we tried to do was because the schools are thinking about that ESSER money, how can we give them what they were expecting, only we're going to take it out of a different different bucket? Cor correct. This the, the, the CRF money we're talking about now is far more restrictive in its use than is the ESSER money. So we're trying to use the CRF money for the eligible costs that are being incurred right now up through June 30th. That's that first pot of money that Jim was talking about, that $20 million that would be reimbursable. And then there are going to be new costs that are not in their budgets for FY21. That's what that second $20 million is aimed towards when we get to FY21, which is part of a grant program. And then the ESSER money on top of that at some and the, point. And then the ESSER money is separate from both those, yes. Yes, and hopefully that's something that we can do to perhaps address some of our ed fund challenges. Um, that, that would be that would be a hope. Um, so basically, if your school has been spending money, not busing students, but busing food because of, of coronavirus, that would be an eligible cost that you could submit for reimbursement. Um, Kathleen James. Um. Oop, you muted again. Thanks. I, I actually found what I was looking for. Um, it's in the section um, below the general guidance that I, sounds to me like is going to apply to the entire bill. Um, I was going to ask whether we shouldn't be reminding schools that the money needs to be spent by December 31st and what to do about schools that kind of willy-nilly went out and spent the money on, you know, not willy-nilly, but if schools spent it on ineligible costs and I see it's addressed there so I'm good to go thanks right so the definition in the first funds is just go ahead and reimburse and in the second it's a grant um, but basically it's being sent out to districts based on title one correct based on your title one count can I clarify one thing for that, uh, Rep? Yes. Rep? Uh, it's up to. So um, it's um, 
they won't just get a grant funding of uh, a proportional amount in accordance with Title I. Um, they'll apply for the, fu the grant fu funding, I believe, and the maximum they'll get is the proportional amount they get under Title I. So you're not going to be sending out money unless they actually have the cost, right? So it has to, it's a maximum. And this came up because we wanted to make sure that some really sophisticated districts didn't go in there and get all the money. <laughs> so we were looking for a way to to make it so that there's access that's um, not going to go to the first 10 districts. Um, are people comfortable with then the definition for number two? Based on, on that, I'm um, Sarita Austin. Yes, um, I just want to ask a clarifying question. Um, again, this article talks about uh, the increase in achievement gaps on with socio, uh, the socioeconomic uh, gaps that will occur um, with you know poorer children. The Title I allocation in the waiting study, it was found that it was inequitable, kind of the reimbursement that students were getting uh, with, that were at a lower so socioeconomic uh, level. I'm wondering, is that formula being used to reimburse schools when I think, you know, we didn't get a chance to you know, have a task force, and I understand that for the waiting study, but is that, is a reimbursement the Title I? Because I was wondering with the grants, if schools identified or districts identified in the waiting study, I mean, they're gonna get like a double whammy already. So they're already um, inequitable in terms of the waiting stunning findings. And now with COVID, I feel not like that's another hit on these students. So I'm just wondering with the grants, is there a way to um, provide them more funding to meet their students' needs? So Ch Chelsea Byers, maybe you can help because this was a conversation we had yesterday on how to fairly make sure that districts have access to these funds, particularly related to learning loss was one of the, the main topics that we had as well as fairness to districts. Um, Chelsea, do you have any comments on that? in response to Representative Austin? Sorry, Chelsea Myers, BSA. Um, I just wanna first say thank you for taking this up. Um, and what we had the discussion on was if we are truly thinking about the CRF funds funding replacing the anticipated ESSER funds, then it would be reasonable to expect Per, that the districts would be expecting the allocation based on the federal dollars and, and the way that they intended for them to be allocated. And in that case, it was Title I dollars, which essentially is different than waiting um, and the waiting study, but it does take into account poverty. Um, I, I don't know that we could ever suggest a perfect allocation method, but it does take into account those students that, um, yeah, are, are at a greater economic disadvantage. Or those systems, I should say, with greater proportions of um, economically disadvantaged students. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Chair Webb, yep. So is there a way with the grants, the way they're allocated to prioritize um, schools with uh, higher levels of students in poverty, or is it is that already taken into consideration? Brad, we, we, we don't we don't. I'm, I'm not sure I ever said this first for the record. Brad Dames, Agency of Education. <laughs> um, just capable. We can see you, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we don't we don't grant directly to schools in general when when we're granting the federal monies we are granting them to the leas and in our case in vermont's case the lea for federal purposes are the supervisor union level and then the supervisor union level the supervisor unions are the ones who disperse the money out to the schools themselves we we don't do that at an agency 
it's a complex thing on how to make sure that the money gets distributed um, or is available to districts. It, it's a, it's not a, it's not an easy answer. We looked at it. We looked at it as enrollment. We looked at it as equalized pupil. We looked at it as ADM, and all of it seemed to run you know smack into the waiting study. So it seemed like using um, Title One, which was what the schools were expecting, was probably our best resource. Title one makes sense to me. I just worry that we've got this unresolved US ed situation, don't we, around guidance with the ESSER money where it's Title I plus distributing to independent schools, whereas this bill just does Title I. And that's just a very fine difference. And we're kind of like trying to get people money for what, you know, it's like, am I correct that we're still waiting to put out the ESSER money precisely because of this question of whether it can be done strictly on Title I or on Title I plus distributing to any independent schools within your LEA? I think we're just that what we were focused on was just trying to, to spend the money the first that uh, has the greatest number of restrictions um, to spend that first. So don't spend ESSER money on, on your buses mm -hmm. because we can spend CRF money on that. Um, and CRF money we ha is tied to very you know tight specific <laughs> guidelines. Um, right, Brad, you but there is an explicit that? Title I piece to ESSER dollars that we heard testimony on that was unresolved. That's all. Yeah, it was, and actually, it was. Um, I don't. Is that Brad, why we were told yeah. that originally wasn't being released? That's like why the ESSER money isn't already out. Uh, the I, I believe Secretary French mentioned this last week at some point. There were the the ESSER money was initially the application was initially held out because of your point that it, that while the the CARES Act said uh, sent out on Title One allocations, the guidance from the U.S. Education Department um, broadened that to make instead of just based on poverty and independent schools for equitable services, uh, it's not just up the the number of kids there on based with an impoverished background. But they based it on enrollment instead. Um, the other reason why the, the rollout was delayed was because the legislature asked us to see some of the committees asked, asked the agency to hold on to the money so they could have some maximum flexibility. Because again, as, as I've said before, and other people said, the ESSER money is much more flexible than the CRF money. So they basically want to use the idea is to use the CRF money first and then the ESSER money later because it's more flexible. Um, going, and going more time back, too. And, and more time too. Going going back to the Title I question, um, what I understood from Secretary Friends last when he was talking, I believe it was you guys last week, or maybe it was another committee. You're, you're starting to blend in. Sorry to say that, but um, but he said uh, he he said that that U.S. Ed was not changing their their guidance on that. They were they were still saying that they should be sent out on that uh, Title One Plus, as you as you put it, allocation method. And some, I understand, some states are choosing to ignore it. <laughs> um, Kelsey, and I, and I also make sure I, that I hear from from the field your reaction as well. Our committee really wants to hear from you, Chelsea. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I will just say that the immediate release of these CRF funds are not restricted in the same way that the ESSER funds are in terms of the independent school guidance, because the guidance applies to the ESSER funds and not to the CRF funds. Um, you all can determine what um, allocation strategy for the most part um, you use. So the independent school question does not need to be addressed until um, it's decided that the ESSER funds are to be released. Thank you. Kathleen James? Um, yeah, could somebody just give me a very quick recap of the independent school question, if, if that's going to be relevant? Thanks. Brad? Um, the, the, in the CARES Act, when they're talking about the ESSER funds, they're saying that, that some of the money that goes out to the LEAs must be, must be used for equitable services to independent schools that have students who've been placed there by their parents to accommodate their, their needs and such. So what, what they said is that it goes out based on the Title I formula. Currently under Title I, um, the, the SUs get, get, their, get their, their allocations. And then 
the independent schools apply for some of that money for equitable services that the SU provides or they pay for it somehow or another. And so when the ESSER money was specified how it was going to be allocated in turn from the federal government, they said along the lines of Title I. And, and they specifically said, including the equitable services piece, I'm certainly paraphrasing here, but they, they said including that equitable services piece. And then the US Ed guidance, that, that equitable service was currently based on the number of kids from impoverished backgrounds, poverty counts, basically. Um, then when US Ed guidance came out about how to disperse this money, how to allocate the, the ESSER money, they changed the, the equitable services allocation from the number of poverty kids in independent schools versus the poverty kids in total to enrollment in independent schools versus enrollment in total. And so what that did is that changed, that changed the percentage of money that would go out to the independent schools. That's not resolved. So there, there's just a hang up right now with how the ESSER money should be or will be distributed to independent schools. What formula will be used? That that's that's what that's what the holdup was, and and it sounds like I I think Secretary French is going to follow the guidance. I'm not certain about that. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, can we hear from the field? Response from the field. Um, Superintendents Je Chelsea and Jeff, do you have anything that you'd like to say in regards any changes that you would make in this language so far? Thank you, Chair Webb. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to participate in the conversation. Is my audio working okay here today? It's good. Okay, great. Um, so the comments that Chelsea made show really the thoroughness with which we're trying to consider this. And we realize that this is the approach that's under consideration by the House. We don't know what the Senate will do yet, and we also haven't heard the specific plan from the administration. So the navigation uh, involves each of the parties that I just referenced. And from the perspective of the field, we've got uh, several interests that I want to convey. Um, the first is I want to just let you know that because of the pace with which this proposal has come about, while we've participated in the conversations. We haven't had any real opportunity to confer with either superintendents or business managers. So my comments are basically qualified by the fact that when this plan takes shape, and I realize it might be affirmed overnight, we will do our best to convey to superintendents and I think by extension business managers what the proposal is. So I wanted to be very clear about that. Um, the second thing that I want to um, offer contextually is while these are large sums of money that are being discussed, we don't have a really good idea yet how much money um, is either been spent or will be spent in the field. And I know that Brad has done um, some estimates as a result of conversations with business managers and our association did a rough survey of school districts. It was a small sample survey to try to understand not only what was being spent, but what it was being spent on. <clears throat> but within the constraints of the program that's being articulated, we're not really sure what we're gonna see in terms of um, reimbursable expenses or projected costs or actual costs as we navigate to the start of school and beyond. I thought that um, Representative Elder's uh, explanation of the, the district that he's involved with was um, both accurate and insightful in terms of the context that he set. So in some instances, schools are spending, as he indicated, thousands of dollars a day to try to maintain services um, through the end of this school year, which is about to end, there's considerations that are gonna be made over the summer um, that have pressures associated with them. And then there's the navigation to the start of school. So my point is this, um, I think that you've got a reasonable approach here. We're not sure how things are gonna unfold. And this is, um, as is understood by everybody, 
the the House um, deliberation on this issue. Um, so those are my contextual comments, and I just wanted to make clear, qualify, I guess, the, the remaining comments that I'm going to make. Um, with regard to the proposal that's been presented to the committee, we understand the rationale and I think um, are generally supportive of it. So the, when you take a look at Section A and the uh, identification of $20 million that would be available for reimbursements to school districts for costs that they have um, incurred, uh, th that makes sense. Um, obviously, we'd be interested in getting um, that money back out to schools because reimbursement connotes that it's money that is spent or will be spent in the very near future. We want to get those resources to schools as soon as possible. This seems to do that. Um, with regard to the transition into fiscal year 21, you're talking about a grant program which is based on Title I, um, which was how the ESSER money was to have been allocated. Um, that makes sense, and you've discussed that already. I think that Title I is a useful measure to make sure that uh, school districts that um, could be construed to have higher need um, is a good allocation formula. Um, with regard to Part 3 in Section A, the $45 million, um, I think that that may beg a little bit more explanation because my understanding was that um, some of these funds may be held in reserve um, to contend with the $150 million shortfall in the education fund. So even though the number is $45 million, it's not exactly clear to me how that money could be utilized um, in the future, either by school districts um, or, and I think that this is probably a synonymous concept, um, uh, to address the deficit in the education fund. What I want to say on that point is that our association understands the deficit in the education fund, and we understand that from a local level, we have to participate in the address of that. Because when you consider the education funding system, um, we basically have a state system which is localized, and you really can't separate a community or communities from the education fund overall. So the, the first two uses, the 20 and $20 million sums, um, I think is consistent with uh, trying to get the money out and get it out fairly. It, the picture becomes a little less clear um, as you get into what is being referred to as tier two money. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying that the, the utilization of the ESSER monies um, as more flexible and uh, a longer timeline does make sense in my mind as we try to navigate um, through FY21 and 22 entirely. So in general, I think we understood what you're trying to do. Um, I think that we're supportive of the approach in the context of the limitations that I cited. Um, we don't know uh, what the ultimate um, result will be as the Senate weighs in, presuming providing that this passes the House, the Senate weighs in, and the administration uh, weighs in. But I would say you're off to a good, you know, I, I'm respectful of the work that you've done, and it, it makes sense. Um, I'll be eager to hear from superintendents and business managers to see if their views are consistent with mine. But uh, I think that the work that you've done so far is good work. So thank you. If I could just add one thing to Jeff um, is just in the reimbursement method, that first $20,000, if we can be as or if you all could be as clear as possible in terms of the methodology of that, um, that making sure that it is an equitable distribution of reimbursement funds so that those who are on the ball and operationally more um, 
have more capacity that they're not the ones getting the lion's share of the funds. And also we have heard from some in the field that we need to make the guidance around reimbursement and the uses of the grant funding extremely clear, um, providing examples and having huge um, education efforts to the field. And I'm sure we would be happy to collaborate on that effort. So if there's any language that needs to be tightened up here um, to make sure that, that the agency is preparing that guidance um, for districts, it does need to be really clear, I would agree. I wanna go to, um, to Sandra and Sue from the um, school boards. Good afternoon, Chair Webb. This is Sue Siglowski from Vermont School Boards Association. Just wanted to thank you very much for um, your work on this bill and provide you with a few um, preliminary comments. I was just able to take a look at it um, when I received it about an hour before the, the hearing. And uh, we think it's important to include the um, carryover of surplus funds. Uh, that's something that school boards have been um, asking for the ability to do. Uh, and, and that is in this bill uh, and also includes, uh, it also would be important to include the point uh, made earlier about being able to carry over any coronavirus funds that can't be spent in FY20 to be able to carry those over into FY21. Um, another uh, point is that it would be very helpful to have maximum flexibility for public schools in this bill. We wouldn't want to, um, to, narrow, to, to, to narrow the ways that they could spend the funds um, beyond what has already been narrowly um, defined by the, the federal um, government. And uh, in the section A2, I wondered about the language regarding um, costs of reopening schools, whether that was perhaps a little bit too, could be interpreted a little bit too narrowly um, because there's certainly gonna be a lot of costs that have to do with not just the actual uh, reopening, but operating once they do reopen um, in this, in this uh, new world. There's a lot of um, a lot of costs that they'll be having that are are new and different. So um, it may be worth taking a look at um, that language of reopening and um, perhaps broadening it a little bit. If, if you if you could send those to us, that'd be great. Okay. And um, so, Sandra, anything? Hello, good afternoon. I think Sue summed it up. I am. Um, I would like to review this a little bit more. I was attending a, another webinar from noon to one. I apologize, but I would like an opportunity to read this a little bit more and we'll be back with any questions. Okay, great. Um, the Teachers Association, Jeff and, and, and Colin. <clears throat> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Jeff Fannin from Vermont NEA. And I know Colin's out there in the somewhere, so. He's capable of certainly speaking up if he thinks I, I run off the, the rails here a little bit. Um, so for, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I do think it's a reasonable approach. I think it was Jeff Francis that described it as that. Uh, and I largely agree with Jeff and Chelsea and, and Sue. Um, and just a couple points I think I'd like to make though. Um, I think the approach is the right one to address the kids' needs. Uh, the, and we're certainly, I don't wanna be a broken record here, but the kids, coming back will be significantly, their needs are gonna be significantly greater. Their social emotional needs are gonna be greater. Their academic needs are gonna be greater. The learning loss is real. And so, and, and uh, it, it's across the board though, right? N not too many kids are falling behind. Everybody's falling behind, if you will. And, and so that, I, that's why I think the first several months, and I don't know how to quantify this, of school when we reopen, is going to be remedial in nature. And I would argue in, in theory, it, it, therefore it's covered by the, the CARES Act, right? I mean, everything that we're gonna be doing 
in school when we come back will we'll be remedial in some way in nature to catch kids back up. And only because of the, the pandemic are we doing that work. But for the pandemic, we wouldn't be doing the work. And so several months, I think, of expenditures and, and work are going to be uh, that nature. Um, I think we ought to account for it and be thoughtful and creative about how we account for that. So I think that's, I think your approach is the right way to do that. So I think that's the, the wise approach. And finally, we, we conducted a, a parent survey some, some weeks ago and we're just getting back the results now. And so I've got some preliminary stuff, but two thirds of the parents said their top concern were the uh, social isolation of their kids. I mean, this is real. Um, parents uh, have, have not liked the, the distance learning, neither have kids. Uh, third, say that their kids are sad. 36% um, say their students have checked, their kids have checked out and uh, half said their children are stressed out. So I think what we're seeing now is parents reporting back that, that this has not been great, that when they come back in the fall, it's gonna be a, a lot of remedial work, social, emotional, as well as academic. And I think the approach you've taken here and using the federal monies to do that work is the right approach. So I applaud you for it. It's a long way to go. I know the process is never easy. So I wish us all luck in that endeavor. Um, any questions, I'm happy to answer those too. Colin, did I miss something? Chime in, I'm sure. Thank you. Let's go to Tracy for special administrators. Great, thank you so much, Chair Webb um, and all. Um, I also jumped off another call, so I've just seen um, this draft um, while we've been on today, but it does seem like a reasonable approach um, to us as well and agree that it really needs to be equitable. Um, we're happy to see the focus specifically on recovery from learning loss and social emotional support. Um, as I said last week in my testimony, those are huge areas for successful reopening um, and to get through the year. Um, so just thinking about, you know, I've been in the weeds last week and this week around the health and safety, um, health and safe reopening task force um, that others in the room are also have been part of. And just for example, school nurses are gonna have to play a much larger role um, in schools. And there's a special population of children that aren't, they're gonna be challenged to follow public health guidance and it's gonna take really some care coordination and truly team-based care. So we've been talking about the costs associated just in that area. So just as everyone knows, it's not gonna be easy and we're gonna to have to have enough funding to get us through um, this in several areas. And it just is also so uncertain. We don't really know what's gonna happen or beyond next year. So flexibility will be important too. Um, so there's just a lot of areas I need to be paying attention to, but I think this is the right approach and it looks, looks good. I'm hearing from a lot of words, a uh, lot, lot of requests to make sure it's flexible enough. If everybody could really take a look and see if the language allows for that and, and provide you know, some opportunity, I think that that is an interest for us to provide flexibility given that we have um, very different communities. Um, Madam so, Speaker, yeah. may I add something? Just, um, it, it, yeah, we are, we just, like everybody else, we've just looked at it and really catching up. And, and yeah. uh, your mention of the word flexibility is, is a great one. And uh, one thing that we've been thinking about, I know we've mentioned to you, uh, is that the, the vote by mail. Uh, Essex Westford did a nice job with that. Uh, I think their, their town clerk said it cost them about $9,000 to do it. So if monies are available for that, it might be a helpful thing to do. They had enormous turnout over the prior years. and. Uh, and their budget passed. I think that's a, uh, a shout out to those in, on the committee, wherever you are, uh, Representative Jim Batista. I know a lot of people work on it, but um, it worked and it worked well. A lot more people voted. That's great for democracy. And we have two more districts voting today. So we'll see what happens there. Real quick, Beth, can I comment on the flexibility point? Yes, please. Um, so if you look at the language, uh, maybe Avery, can you pull it back up the, the Thank you. Okay. So if you 
Go up to the very top of the goal. Okay. Subdivision one, um, if you look at, uh, at the line um, six, it's for reimbursing uh, chronic costs incurred by school districts. That is as broad as you can be. Um, right. So that has all the flexibility there. Right. Two and three are more restricted. Right. Uh, two says on line um, uh, 12 and 13, it can be used to assist for the cost of reopening schools. That's more restrictive. So that could be changed to mirror what's in one, which is to use it for any eligible current cost. So that's more restrictive. And three is more restrictive too, because on line 20 and 21, it's the cost of, um, of uh, helping students recover from learning loss and with social and emotional support. So those two, two and three are more restrictive and they could change to be like one, which gives maximum flexibility to cover any eligible corona cost. So just to mention, if you want to make it more flexible, my recommendation would be to, to mirror within one in two and three. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have us think about that. And Avery, if you can find a time for us to meet tomorrow, that'd be great. <clears throat> When are we on the floor? Two, we're on the floor at two tomorrow? Oh, okay, so there is time. If you could find a time for us to, to check back in, give committee members a chance to do that. I think what we're gonna need to do is move on to higher ed. And we have nobody here in the room. Um, I did ask, I did um, speak with UVM and I addition from, um, from the chancellor, let me just pull this up. Um, no, it's not there, I'm sorry. Larry, take over for a minute. <laughs> okay, actually, I think I found it. Um, Caleb, did you want to say something before we move move to higher ed? Well, yeah, just on this thought of flexibility and what could be done with the language, I had some thoughts on that. Um, okay. I agree with Jim that one under A is the most flexible. I think everything of the 40 million should be moved into that. And I think that the line about Title I A funds should apply to all of it. Uh, and that it should just cover FY20 and FY21 and should make it clear that any time between June 10th and the beginning of FY21 is also covered. Just to make sure that anybody who is questioning whether running a summer school meals program is a cost that they can get money for, they know that to the extent these funds cover it, the answer is yes. So that's all just, I think it should be one section. I personally, think three with a 45 million should be different. I can save that comment, but I think our tier two money, I believe should be segregated under the heading. If we can use it for revenue replacement, all 75 million goes to the ed fund. If we can't, here's our plan. And so I would like to see that a more segregated section. So anyway, we can talk about that later, but I just kind of feel like the place for that 45 million isn't actually on the first page. So you do know also, just, to, just to, uh, to be clear, that the money that we're working on right now does not include the 150 million set aside for the Ed Fund. So that's, that's considered, there, there's thoughts about that out there as well. So that we're just, we're just doing this part of it, but the 150 everybody knows is there. Um, and, but it'd be great if everybody can take a look and we'll, we'll, we'll do our, House Ed Committee noodling with it tomorrow. Um, Kathleen. You're okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I spoke with, um, I spoke with uh, Wendy at UVM and I asked her what she was looking for. Um, and um, 
they were looking for uh, financial aid for families affected by COVID-19. And what they'd like is about 20 million to do that, which is gonna be a little hard. Um, they're looking for funds, they would spend it on technology, equipment to outfit classrooms for online learning. You know, so example, if you had a, a 101 course going on with 200 students, maybe you're gonna do, uh, there you're gonna divide the class up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, one third of the students will go on each day and the rest is online. Um, professional development for online learning, they've discovered that teaching remotely and teaching in the classroom is very different. And if the other one was they have 41 research projects related to COVID-19 that, that they've applied for federal funds and they're hoping to get it. In terms of the things that the community colleges recommended, um, they were looking, for example, uh, 2 million for community, co community um, College of Vermont students to help with childcare and transportation and housing. Um, they were looking for maybe 300,000 to help with devices for, for remote learning. Um, the residential colleges, um, they're looking at testing and contract tracing. They're looking at instructional design assistance. Uh, campus safety technology, PPEs, emergency funds for enrolled students, isolation unit expenses, including medical care and food, food delivery, and um, basically dealing with scholarships and discounts of tuition, personnel costs in terms of addressing paid sick leave, and um, uh, Yes, that's it. And lost, lost revenue. So, so those are the kind of issues that we're talking about. So there's 50 million that we just spent right there, but we don't have it to spend. <laughs> we, we have um, 10 million that we were looking at uh, for tier one and what was, and 35, 30 million, I think. Peter Conlon, did you have a comment? Uh, no comment. I just had a, a question actually. Yeah. Just a, a, lot of, a lot of what you read are things that they'd like to have money to spend money on right. as opposed to looking for reimbursement for COVID-19 related expenses in FY 2020. Right. Um, and I, I just wondered if, if you or if maybe anybody else here has got the expertise can just give us a little rundown of uh, money uh, that, that hasn't been talked about here that um, colleges and universities are already receiving from, yeah. from other pots. I think we just gave them 15 million each, didn't we? In the last, was that in, Dylan, do you remember? In the bill we passed a few days ago? Yeah, the, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, um, but there was 5 million that was put into reserve uh, for bridge funds. And there was an additional, I, I think it was 10 million. So I would have to look at the document, but I know a piece was the reserve of the bridge funding. And the other portion. Um, could we bring up the, the bill again, Avery, to look at higher ed? One thing you, you find out is that uh, nobody really keeps track of higher ed in the state. The Agency of Education doesn't really. Um, Congress pays some attention, but, uh, and it used to be the school board, I mean, the state board, Um, I'll see if we can get the colleges in on uh, tomorrow, if we can find a time to meet. I appreciate the, the sense of patience I'm getting from the committee as, as we try to work on this without having had two days to work on it. <laughs> Not an easy task. I think you're, you're good to um, schedule some time tomorrow so we have a chance to digest a lot of this information. Right. I, I think so too. So Avery, you're look, I'm looking for that document if you can find it. The other, uh, while she's doing that, the other comment I would make about those requests you just read is, um, uh, you know, they, again, the, the cares or the this money has the restrictions it's got to be expended by December 31st. Exactly. I'm not sure a whole lot of that 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 it can happen. So well, let, let's see how we handle this in the bill. And you know, it's. We're, we're different from other committees in terms of what we're doing. Oops, that's the wrong one. Let's not bring that one up again. <laughs> we're done with that one. Sorry about that. Would you mind giving me a, a number um, for the bill? Is it, it's not the current one that we're discussing, but was it one in, what was the yeah, number? It's the one we were just discussing. Oh, the one we were just discussing. Yeah. Okay. 
Sorry about Kathleen, that. In the meantime, did you have something you wanted to say? Late. I think this relates to Caleb's question, which is why I raised my hand and then said, never mind, but now I'm now I'm back to it. So if all of the spending that we've outlined um, in this bill totals 75 million, no, totals 125 million. 125. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and we have been allotted 50 million for first tier needs and 75 million for second tier needs. But the 75 million of second tier needs could be part of the money that the legislature has set aside to fill the budget gap if we indeed realize we can use it for that, which I think would be everybody's, well, it would be probably my first choice. So I think pursuant to, to Caleb's question, shouldn't we designate that somewhere or say that somewhere? The 150? No, the 75. Here too. Um, am I making, am I being clear? Yeah, I think the confusion is that the the um, the seventy for the the there the hundred and fifty there there is one hundred and fifty already set aside. So this is above the seventy five that we're talking about is above the hundred and fifty. But isn't the seventy five like the size of the FY twenty budget shortfall, and the one hundred and fifty is the size of the estimated FY twenty one budget shortfall? I don't know that it, it it broke it out that way, but I see Chip Conquest, and I just want to make sure that perhaps he has something to say in relation to this. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, my understanding is that the money that you're all are talking about here um, for your consideration of CRF spending is completely separate from the money that is um, has been set aside to make up the Ed Fund. Those two. Um, at least in any near term future are not going to come together. So the 150 has been set aside um, or or has been we've said we're not going to look at spending that until we find out whether we can um, use it to replace lost revenue and therefore make up the Ed fund. Okay. I'll point out that the Ed fund shortfall um, continues to shrink. Um, and last I saw, which was I think this morning, it is less than it's somewhere just over a hundred million dollars between FY20 and, and 21. So I think okay. the amount of money that's there is sufficient to cover any of the expected uh, shortfall in the Ed Fund. So the money we've set aside, Chip, um, in the hopes that we might be able to use it to cover the, the gap in the education fund is set aside in a different pot and we're not, we're not double allocating it here. Correct. Okay, thanks. So that the other question. thing I wanted to bring up is the difference between tier one and tier two. And I've been trying to uh, converse with my um, committee chair. Um, I haven't been able to get a hold of her, but I've talked to the um, vice chair a little bit. So what, what we're hoping to get from you all is um, what is your tier one Proposal in some detail, as as you've been as you have here in the in the bill that's or the draft here. Um, tier two is, and this is what I'm trying to get an understanding of. Tier two, I as my understanding is that that amount of money may vary um, in in all the committees. To once we sort of have a determination of of what is available to spend, and and mostly it may vary. Um, at least again, in my understanding, it may increase because we find that some committees aren't spending as much as they have total. Um, we may find out uh, other uses of the um, CRF money. But what, we're, what, what we'd like to get from you is basically a, a list of here, if we get to tier two or when we get to tier two, here are the things we're thinking about. But the detail is really needs to be about what we're spending in tier one. And so I, um, and what I'm trying to get a, a sense from my committee chairs is what's the lag time between tier one money going out and tier two money going out? Because I think you all need to know that in order to make decisions about what 
what you want to put in tier one relative to what you think might best be in tier two. Um, so things you want to get out the door, you feel like you need to get out the door right away, um, should be in the tier one category. And I just don't know what the lag time between those two is, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to find out. So, um, sorry, just to, okay. So the, um, great. I, I was confusing the tier two money. Um, I, I thought that the tier two funds were um, part of the, the set aside. So we're either gonna use those for the set aside or if they get freed up, we'll use them for tier two. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and just so I further understand, so what you need from us in this bill is a very clear delineation, not just the whole 125 million, but a very clear delineation between the first 50 and the second 75, or as Kate was saying, the first 75 and the second 50. So we've listed it as one and two are actually our tier one and, and three in this is our tier two. And I don't know, I don't know if that's clear or that language has to be um, clarified. D Jim, do you have a, a thought on that? And then I, we've got to get to the colleges. Well, we're, we're using the terms tier one and two, tier two in this bill so far. I mean, that's that's more of a um, kind of a, a structure that's being used by appropriations, but that language isn't here. So I don't think it's intended to be in, in the bill language. So probably it could come, we could have a letter accompany it. Yep. Yeah, okay. So I will, I will get a little more clarity um, tonight sometime and, and email the chair, Chair Webb, um, about what it is, as, as specifically as I can get it, what it is we're expecting from you. But um, to, to uh, Jim Demaray's point, I think that that's why I brought it up is because there's nothing in here that designates what, what you expect to spend in tier one and what in tier two. And so I think that'll need to be clear in some fashion to okay. our committee. Okay. Let's pull up the next section for Vermont State Colleges and UVM, or Tier 1 and Tier 2. Would you mind giving me a line number or page number for that? Keep going. OK, there you go. B <laughs> on line 8, we start. Thank you. And note that this language here is like the number one in the first subsection has maximum flexibilities for any eligible coronavirus costs. That's true for uh, both fiscal year 20 and below and number two, fiscal year 21. So this is a very flexible language here for, for higher education. So we also have, I'm looking at, thank you, Dylan, for sending um, out the, um, the uh, first quarter budget. And in that there is 15.355 million to UVM and um, 15.258 million to the Vermont State Colleges um, for distance learning equipment, supplies, facilities. So that's, that's to me seems like that's some of their past spending. It, was that a sense that, that you would have? We don't have Peter. Pagan in the room um, anymore. So it's it almost seems, is it possible that this is really money, more money that's going forward? Do you know um, anybody? Uh, Madam Chair? Yeah. I mean, I, I won't speak specifically to what this particular sum of money would be, but I think it probably is anticipating uh, future costs. The money within the quarter one budget that was passed, I can speak to the Vermont State Colleges, um, yeah. certainly for identified reimbursable uh, expenses that were viewed as coronavirus uh, relief fund eligible. And so those were put in. And then also in the bill, just so you know, there's also um, $5 million set aside uh, for reserves with the intent of bridge funding. So I think that this is a conversation starter probably with the Senate as this process moves forward. Okay, so we've written it right now, the way we have it written is that it's similar to our um, to our pre-K twelve, does that need to change? 
I, I personally think it's too much to the colleges and I feel bad saying that, but I look at the whole 50 million tier one and I have to think schools have already spent 25, 30 million that'll need to be revert. Um, I don't know, it's just to give a full 20% of that money to the colleges when they already got 30 million and the schools haven't gotten a dime yet. It, it seems like too much of the first 50 to me. I won't belabor it, but that, that's just my kind of first look. Others. Peter Conlon. Yeah, uh, I just remember that we're not giving them $10 million. Um, they have to have eligible expenses. So it, it only counts if they have the money to spend. And uh, Brad has indicated that, in fact, schools, you know, really are at about, at probably at most, 10 million in eligible costs at this point. Um, so I think we're going to have, if anything, trouble allocating all this money for eligible expenses. So we've allowed the greatest flexibility possible in their use, but we're still, it's important to remember that we're still highly restricted by the rules of the coronavirus relief fund strings. Anybody else? Looks like Brad had a comment. Yeah. 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 Could, could I jump in just the quick Clarification. Yeah. Just a quick clarification on what Mr. Common said. That roughly 10 million number that I meant that I'm estimating does not include uh, the cost of people that we were discussing yesterday in terms of um, their personnel costs being eligible when they're doing remote learning planning. And we figured that that's what would you say, 20, 200 minutes per week or something? Is that what I? Yeah, I, I, I'm not certain what it would really be. I, I know that. Um, that a the superintendent said that um, I, I I don't know without really can people and talking to people, but I th I think I, the, the number that I put out there that Secretary French was about fifteen to sixteen million dollars is a rough back of the envelope calculation, um, and from from the reaction. Oops, we're losing you. You just you just muted. <laughs> it's my fat thumb. It hit the button. <laughs> There we go. Um, so I, I'm not sure where you're asking, but but my my back of the envelope estimate was about 15, 16 million dollars, as the secretary said, um, based on some of the conversations that we were hearing yesterday with the superintendent, a, a businessman, special education director. It sounded like they did have significant um, times that they that they would be able to code to this. So I, I don't know what the real number would be um, without talking to people much in in much more detail. Thank you. Serena? Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you can refresh my memory. This money can be used or could be used for reimbursing students for food and residential costs. And do we know what those are so far? I don't think we have anybody in the room that, that has that information. Okay. Wasn't there, um, wasn't there a discussion um, that the state colleges were going to receive five million and UVM to reimburse students for. I'm pretty sure that that was in the. That was in the CARES money. Yeah. Yes, they they did get money. Everybody got money, and half of it went to the institution, and half went to students. That's right. Okay. For the FY twenty school year. Peter. Sorry, I just didn't take my hand down. I apologize. Okay. Um, Avery, can you bring that language back up? Because I, we've got to do something with it. <laughs> I, I, I think we probably need to have um, Wendy and Sophie come in and speak to us. And I'll, I'll send them a copy of this draft and see if we can get some of your questions answered between now and 24 hours. <laughs> um, so we're giving them 10 million right now up front at the moment, and that's for reimbursable costs. And then we have 30 million. Um, can you scroll up a little bit on that, Avery? Keep go, 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 go. yeah. I'm gonna get to, oh, I'm sorry, Let's scroll the other way. <laughs> yeah, scroll down, I guess is what. So, yeah, 
Yeah, so this is just basically doing reimbursement again. Um, oh boy, and I'm looking at all the things that they're looking for. <laughs> Money to help students with childcare, residential health and safety issues, research. Um, I don't know, I'm looking to your committee. I don't have a big, I don't have any quick, good answer here, whether we're getting this right or not. We don't have, we don't have anybody in the room at the moment. Let me pass this on to, um, to the state colleges. Let me pass this on to the state colleges and UVM and um, Avery, would you pass this on to them and, and see if we, you can get them to join us tomorrow? I just mentioned, uh, Chair Webb, that to the extent that those, um, that list uh, that they provide to you, that list uh, includes um, COVID-related costs, this, this would cover, help cover that. Yes. To the extent that list includes things that are not COVID-related, this, this bill can't cover that. Yeah. So, right, so, yeah. So COVID-related research, you think, would probably not be... I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not giving an opinion on the yeah. list. I'm just saying yeah. whoever is on the list that's COVID related, this could cover, but this can't cover anything that's not COVID related. So yeah. they'll have to be done separately. So we've basically very broadly um, included everything that's COVID related. Yeah. And we haven't delineated who gets the money. It's just to be distributed to. Well, it's going to the two schools, so they, yeah. they decide how to use it, yeah. But we haven't said you get this much and you get this much, right? Yeah, uh, so of uh, the 10 million appropriation above, it's five and five. Oh, it is, okay. It's 30 million the, the, the appropriation is going down to line two and three on the next page, it's 15. Oh, okay. Okay, excellent. Kathleen, James? I just... Sorry, um, just when you reach out to the colleges, um, I, I guess I'd be interested in uh, that question about how, you know, I guess just making sure since they're already getting money in the um, first quarter budget, you know, how this additional money squares up with that. That's fair. I don't know if it's possible for tomorrow to hear from anybody about school food service, but I am hearing that like some really big districts that usually operate summer meals have just declared they're not going to. And we have an ask from a bunch of different um, groups for a $12 million um, cost to help cover that. I know that would be a really hard thing to like plug into a bill like this, but to the extent other committee members are interested in that, we all have it in our email. And I personally would love to see us do anything that at the very least makes it clear to schools that they can access these funds to pay for those costs if that is what their districts are endeavoring to do. Now here's a piece of good news because I brought this up with the speaker in a conversation with her yesterday. And she said, we are not gonna leave anybody hungry. <laughs> and which committee ends up, uh, where the money comes from, uh, she's not sure yet but she's very clear that hunger is an issue that the legislature will be dealing with. Um, so it's I was- These believing... programs are being shut down like right now. Yeah. I, I believe Human Services is, is working on that appropriation for the 12 billion for summer food, food programs. Great. Thank you. Um, if you know where that, is that that would make our committee feel a little bit more comfortable that would that would appreciate it is that is katie clinton working on that Katie's working on that, i think with uh rep Pew. Yeah. okay is um caleb is this the letter from hunger free vermont nofa vermont yeah. food bank yes it came out last week and there's a newer version that just came out this morning yep i'm just looking at that okay um so is summer delivery of food, um, I'm just wondering where that fits in the educational, bearing in mind, I wanna see those kids get fed and I want these programs to work. <laughs> um, 
does that fall into the education category? Um, if my, that, my my understanding just is yeah. that basically these programs are typically operated in the summer. Yeah. But because there were over expenditures that kind of blew budgets related to food service and FY20, until those reimbursements are realized, there is not the money to do it, particularly here in the last three weeks of FY20. Those dollars right. are gone. So getting those reimbursements would let them pay forward in some cases. But I think districts are saying, hey, we're underwater for our FY20 food service budget. We've got to stop right now. And so the the typically delivery isn't part of that, but there are districts that just run that federal summer school meals that are saying, we can't do it because we don't have the staff. We don't have the staffing budget because we already spent that money on the extraordinary cost of FY20. Right. So it's a it's a it's a revenue problem. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Kil, I was just gonna say Caleb's point's a good one. Um, yeah. and we've certainly heard this from the field that at a minimum school districts want an assurance that they're gonna be getting this money as quickly as possible so they can at least in a way deficit spend with some guarantee that mm -hmm. they will be reimbursed for the uh, food distribution that's gone on so far. You know, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure in terms of the summer program, uh, I'm not sure school districts have ever funded them. I think they were federally funded. It looks like the letter has some specific attachments that I haven't clicked on yet with budget numbers. Have you seen, have you seen that, uh, that document, um, Jim? Uh, so I'm on mute. Uh, no, I have not. You haven't, okay. Um, Perhaps we need someone from the from the uh, Human Services Committee to just give us a little progress update on that, because I'm I'm with you, Caleb, that um, it's a priority for the state, at least for me, at least. Absolutely. Um, Sarita. Yeah, do you know if the meals program is a universal uh, program or if it's needs based? Does anybody know that? I think some school districts have universal and some don't. Okay. I mean, I definitely would support a needs based at this point, you know, when there's not a lot of money to go around. I don't know if I would support a universal program at this point. I think when we I were taking, when we took testimony on that, the universal school meals topic was it 25 percent caleb do you remember there was some percentage of districts or schools that offered universal school meals but i don't remember it off the top of my head yeah but we do remember that we're a bunch of schools that were hoping to put that into their budgets this year and then just got, kind of got sidelined by covid19 so expecting that to perhaps not not come this year. But in terms of summer programs, I, I guess I would assume that's a needs base, but I can't speak for it for sure. Okay. So for tomorrow, um, Avery's going to try to find a slot for us. Um, and Avery's, you're going to reach out to Sophie and um, Wendy, right? And Chip Conquest, when do you need this beautiful document? Um, so uh, I believe that um, committees are asked to get the get it to us by noon tomorrow. By noon, excellent. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I probably shouldn't say it, but I think there's an expectation that um, we won't get them all by noon. <laughs> I would imagine uh, that would be true. Um, I, and I did just uh, was able to talk to the chair, so I just wanted to leave you with a little bit more clarity about tier one and tier two. So uh, the tier one um, is the stuff that we're going to have basically on the floor, you know, probably next week. It's, you know, we're going to have it in our committee. Um, we may, may even try to vote it out um, by Friday, if not, probably by Monday. Um, so it's the stuff that's going to go quickly, um, get out the door and get, um, well, at least we'll get to the Senate. Um, can't speak for them, but uh, 
but the intent is that this is money that that will go out very quickly. Tier two um, really remains to be seen. It's um, it depends in some to some degree on um, what the federal government um, tells us in terms of their guidance for um, spending of the CRF dollars that are um, that we have um, as time goes on. Um, and so, you know, we want to hear from committees about what that what their um, priorities are for a next level of spending. But when or to what degree we'll be able to do that um, is not not clear at this point. So I, I guess I would just say that anything that you all that your committee feels is, you know, really the, the most critical um, needs that you want to make sure you're addressing really ought to be in the in the tier one in the stuff that we're going to be um, voting on probably next week on the, on the floor. Okay. Okay, committee. Avery, you don't have anything avail anything sorted out yet, do you for tomorrow? We've given you I've given you so much notice. <laughs> I actually I did reach out to the committee services team and there are a lot of meetings happening right now. So in order for it to be staffed, it would be ideal if it happened before 1030. Sounds good to me. Is that Jim, are you going to be available? I'm completely available, but if I if we have to turn around for noon, I'd recommend we meet first thing because I'll need time to revise it and have it edited. And, 8.30? Right. Can we do 8.30? 9 o'clock. <laughs> I have a meeting at 8. Could I? Cancel it. <laughs> uh, I wish I could. I've done that twice already. Can you, can you meet at 8.30? Probably 9 o'clock. Um, nine o'clock. Nine. Eight forty-five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm pressing nine o'clock. Okay. I, I, if that I'm pressing. I, okay. I'm pushing hard. Well, fortunately, you've been involved in this conversation pretty directly for a while, so um, you're you're pretty you're up to speed, and whereas the rest of the committee is is not. So, um. So it, it, there's a, probably a, a lot more background that committee members are going to need that you're not going to need. So we'll go with nine o'clock, Jim, best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and hoping that we can get the colleges in to speak to us and any of the other folks, um, Brad, and, you know, Chloe, whatever would be great. And Chloe, actually, do you want to take the last couple of minutes that we've already gone over and um, just talk to us about the, the current um, the status of the Ed Fund? See if Chloe's, yeah, there she is. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was had, I was muted and locked out of my iPad. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you do that. Um, um, so yeah, I would be happy to do that. Um, I sent, um, let's see, what's the best way to, uh, Avery, I don't know if you have a copy of this, but since you have screen control, no, so not this one. Um, oh, but that one's really handy. Put that, put that one, put that one on our website, because I think we, we never yeah. quite got to that. And it's, it's really a handy thing for everybody can look at. Right, um, that is um, that sort of a uh, tabular view of Jim's draft. Right. Um, and I think uh, potentially that could be something that gets um, sent along with the draft to appropriations so that they can clearly delineate um, sort of your thoughts on tier one and tier two. Yeah. I can't turn my video on so you can see me, hello. Um, so, uh, in terms of the education fund, Avery, I think the easiest way for you to would be to pull down an education fund outlook from that was just presented in Ways and Means that would be on their website. That might be the easiest way for us to um, get it quickly. Um, I can also maybe forward you an email. Um, 
do 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 because then that will be we, um avery since we're oh my gosh Eight, look at that Woo! nice um sorry kathleen do you want to continue your question nope i thought we were gonna have more of a gap oh okay um well so basically what we're seeing here is that last night at 9 30 we got an updated revenue forecast um it actually basically shows um, that we're much better off in the education fund than we thought that we were. Um, and that's primarily because um, consumption taxes, sales taxes particularly are coming in stronger than anticipated. Um, and so where we were previously looking at a $150 million deficit, oh, again, trying to scroll down on a screen I don't control. Um, uh, if you go to the bottom, you can see the final line, um, keep on, uh, it's now 106.4. It was previously 156. Um, so essentially what you're seeing here is um, previously the, so sort of like uh, taking January as our starting place, um, we were previously projecting a revenue shortfall from what we were anticipating in January of negative $55 million in FY20. That has subsequently been reduced to uh, approximately negative 31 million. So um, that's a $25 million sort of, let's call it gain in FY20. That means that we don't end FY20 with a deficit. We actually end with um, geez, uh, 19.5 million in um, the stabilization reserve. So that's a reserve of about 2.7%. So that helps us because we, you know, essentially carry forward that $25 million that we weren't anticipating. And we don't have to, you know, refill the reserve in, uh, we don't have to completely refill the reserve in um, FY21. Um, we only have to refill the, we only have to provide an additional 18.5 million to refill that FY21 reserve. Um, the FY21 revenues have also, are also projected to come in a little bit better. Um, previously, we were projecting a shortfall of negative 100 million, and now that's um, let's go, about. So let's scroll back up to the, you're talking about that one or? Well, uh, so it's both of these columns. It's the final two columns, both FY20, okay. both of these columns. Um, the revenues that we're talking about are sales and use tax, purchase and use, meals and rooms, um, and the lottery transfer. So we were pr pr previously projecting a negative $100 million sort of incremental loss in those than what we were expecting in um, January. And now we're looking at um, negative 75 million. So um, the 25 million from FY20 and the uh, $25 million better in FY21 bring our problem down uh, amazingly $50 million. Um, so that's good news, but I do want to sort of um, a little bit have you take that with a grain of salt um, because uh, Consumption taxes are obviously extremely volatile. Um, and, you know, if there were, in the same way that we've been getting forecasts that show that we're, you know, every time they've been getting a little bit better, they, they just as easily could get a little bit worse if, for example, there was another outbreak in the fall. Um, so it's extremely sort of difficult to model this, um, but, you know, we can take the good news for, for right now, but I just want you to have uh, a little bit of a reminder in your back of your head about um, just the volatility of those consumption taxes. Well, it's nice to have a little bit of good news. Right, I, yeah, mm -hmm. it's good, to, it's, it's good. I mean, only a hundred million, excellent. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> what that may end up doing is um, freeing up some additional CRF funds to go into um, sort of continue you know, having more funds available to address some of the problems that you just spent the last two hours talking about, you know, um, loss of learning, food stability, you know, all of those good things. Yeah. Okay. 
so by August, we should have no deficit. Is that the plan? <laughs> That's the I mean, plan, I, are, I don't know. It depends. <laughs> I hope are all of you guys going out and spending your, you know, hundred and twelve hundred dollars from the federal government. Oh, that was well um, spent. <laughs> so I think that that's really largely what you're seeing here is that you, you are seeing the effect of that stimulus money here. Um, Grant Campbell can speak to that a little bit more from our office. But um, with the unemployment rates that, you know, we are seeing and we know that we have the fact that we're seeing, you know, increased performance in our sales and use taxes um, really does sort of reflect um that stimulus money, you know, people people are are still spending. Whereas normally, you lose your job, you don't continue to buy washing machines and uh, you know, whatever. Um, but I think one of the theories is that um, a lot of people are home doing some home improvement projects, and because of the stimulus money, people do have more disposable income than. Um, than they normally would, especially some of the lower income people with the generosity of the um, UI program, which was essentially $600 a week, which is $15 an hour, which is more than those people are potentially used to making. Um, but uh, that stimulus is currently scheduled to run out in July. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens after that. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much. And and do um, send your your document to to um, Avery. And and I think that it's a little bit easier to read than legislative <laughs> the draft. Yeah, he actually already has it. I just um, yeah. wanted to sort of see how the discussion went before. Yeah. Before uh, posting. So we'll pull that up again tomorrow. Um, yeah, and I will be I I'll, I will be available for tomorrow's meeting as well, so I can okay. go over that. Are there any other comments before we end? Any anyone from the field that needed to say make, have one last thing to say? <laughs> All right. I miss I miss seeing you in the halls. That's for sure. <laughs> it's a little easier yeah, in the halls. It really is. Yeah. Um, poke your head well, into the committee yeah yeah and i mean good news that they're thinking about reopening schools so really good news really good news um well i think with that we can we can go off live